We have been looking into what's new for 2013 through the month of January, and I've been talking to you about things that change in our lives. We've been looking at what's new when we know Christ, because when we know Christ, it should be different. That which is new should be new and fresh to us every day, because God is in the business of making all things new. He can make you new. This can be the best year you've ever had, even in the midst of all the struggles that we see on every hand. And the problems and issues that we see in our world, God can handle those things, and he can handle them in your heart and in your mind, and they don't have to frustrate you. So we talked last week about a new start, and I trust that God will give us a new start this year, even today, that today might be a new start. A couple of years ago, I shared a message with you, and I have altered that message somewhat today, but if you have a pencil and paper, I just challenge you to take it out and write down some of these verses and some of these scriptures and remember some of these things because as we look at what's new for 2013 and a new start, I want to talk with you about this subject today. And I use this because this is important. Are you a victim or a victor? Some of you will remember maybe a couple of years ago when I shared that message. Are you a victim or a victor? And I just want to share it again because there's so many people in the church who have not heard this, this thought and this idea. Because when we're in Jesus Christ, we are not victims, we're victors. We live on the victory side and we're to live on the victory side. And yet, do you know what I discover? I discover so many Christians who still feel they're victims. It doesn't matter what the situation is. It doesn't matter whether it's a home situation, whether it's a work situation, whether it's something out in our society, we feel that we're victims and we feel that people are against us. I talk with people continually who tell me that everybody's out to get them. I hear it all the time. And I, and I just can't believe that everybody's out to get me. I don't believe that. I believe the Lord Jesus is here with me. I think he's walking with me and he's talking with me and fellowshipping with me and helping me and strengthening me and encouraging me and all the things that I preach, I believe they're true. I know it. I live it day by day. I can't stand here and preach this stuff if I don't believe it in my heart, and I do. I believe that Jesus is real. And as Christians, I think you have a mindset. And I think it's time to change your mind if God speaks to you today and speaks to your heart, and I hope he will. And if you're in here as a victim today, I hope you'll go out of here as a victor, okay? We live in a world where everyone seems to be a victim in some way or another, as I just mentioned to you. But God's design is that we make the things life may throw at us in the stepping stones to victory instead of becoming a victim. I look in the scripture and I see a lot of people who went through very, very difficult times and real struggles. I look at Peter, for instance, and you know how he denied the Lord and said he never would. I look at Peter, how he was threatened and his life was threatened and all of those things happened to him. And he certainly needed, um, he, he needed to claim victory in Jesus Christ. I see Paul the Apostle. I, I think of when Paul and Silas were imprisoned. I don't know if you know the story, but they were in Rome, and, and, and the scripture tells us that it happened that when they prayed, there was a certain girl who was possessed by a demon, and she was following them through the streets, and she was screaming at them and just yelling at them day after day after day. And she did it, the scripture says, for many days. She, she said, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And she kept doing that and doing that and doing that. And Paul turned around and said to her, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And he called the demon right out of that girl. Now you would say, wow, that was a wonderful thing. And she ceased what she was doing immediately. She stopped doing it. That was a wonderful thing. And you would think, wow, isn't that great he did that? But you know what? The men of the city were using this girl. She was a circus piece, if you will. And uh, she was, they were making money with this girl and uh, with, with her mind being gone and so forth. And they were so angry, so angry at Paul for doing that, for freeing this, this, this girl from, they, that they gathered those two together and they took them into the magistrates and they said, these people are doing things we don't do here in Rome. They're Jews and they're doing things we don't do here in Rome. That's just what the scripture says. They believe things we don't believe. 
And so the magistrate said, cast him into prison. And when they cast him into prison, he said, now listen, we have to make sure they're secure. And so they put him in the center of the prison, the Bible says, the middle of the prison, and they locked them down and even put chains on their legs and on their hands. They bound them in chains. And so there they are in the prison. And as they're there, they began to sing praises to God. Now, I don't know what you would do in that situation. You'd probably wish you had your cell phone. You could call a lawyer or call a friend or call somebody or do something. Uh, you would wish you had something that would help you get out of that place. You would be disgusted and busted and hurt and, and troubled and in a mess. And you just, oh, what am I going to do? I'm so miserable here. Let me tell you what Paul and Silas did. You know what they did? What did they do? What they do? Loud. Okay, they prayed and sang, didn't they? They began singing in prison. They began praising God. They began worshiping the Lord and praising Him. Now think about this scene. There's a jailer there that said, I can't believe you guys. What's going on? Here you are bound this way. And he said, what do I need to do to be saved? Well, let me tell you what happened when they were praying and praising. When they were praying and praising, they didn't have to cry, and, oh God, what are we going to do? Can you deliver us, God? Can you get us out of this mess? Can you help us, God? We're so troubled, we don't know what to do. Listen, they just began to praise Jesus. We love you, Lord, and we're here for you, and we want to glorify your name, and you just do what you want to do with us. And you know what God did? God sent an earthquake. And those old chains just fell off. And the jailer was so scared and so afraid that he got his sword and he was ready to fall on his sword. And Paul said, don't take your life, it's okay. Don't take your life, it's all right. And he said, what must I do to be saved? Listen, you have people watching you. You have family and friends watching you. You have people observing how you handle the issues of life. Are you handling like Paul and Silas in the midst of the troubles and the turmoils and the messes of life? Are you praising and praying and trusting? Or are you grumbling and complaining and calling out for help and praying that God will deliver you? Listen, God knew they needed to be delivered. They didn't even have to ask. All they had to do was praise. Praise. Keep that in mind as we go through this lesson because it's a very important thing. We think of Job. Job was in big trouble too, and he lost everything that he had. And it's an interesting thing as we look at that scripture because in James chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, listen to what these words say. These words say, they say, My brethren, take the prophet who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. He suffered, but he had patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord. The Lord is very merciful and compassionate, it says. The Lord is very merciful and compassionate. God has an end. God sees beyond what you see. And if you find yourself a victim of something today, listen, God sees the other side. God sees the end of it all. God sees what's going to happen in the future. And God is very compassionate and very merciful. Oh, I could tell you of David and his conflict with the Amalekites and all of these things. But David praised the Lord and worshiped God and trusted him. So God's design is that we take the things that happen to us in life. And instead of calling ourselves victims and wondering how God can deliver us from these terrible people who are torturing us and doing whatever they are to us, Lord, how can I be a blessing to other people? How can I worship you, praise you, thank you, give glory to you? How can my life count for you? And if we would do that, we would stop being victims and we would become victors. You are of God, John says. John the Beloved in 1 John 4, 4, he says, you're of God. I've been telling you that it's different for the Christian. This year can be different for the Christian. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. You've overcome them because Jesus has overcome them. Jesus said, don't be discouraged because I have overcome the world, he says. And then he says, because he who is in you is greater than he that's in the world. 
Satan can come against you. Satan can bring people against you. Satan can bring circumstances against you. Satan can bring your employer, your government, your friends, your everything in the world against you. And you look and you say, I don't even want to live anymore. This life's not even worth living. And we can just be a victim and a victim and a victim. But I'll tell you something. When we start seeing and understanding that God is in us, he said, you're of God, little children. You become a child of God, and greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. 1 John 5, 4 and 5 says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. There you have it. You either believe the, world or you, the word or you do not. Whoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Romans 8, 37 says, Oh, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So are you a conqueror? Are you a victor? Or are you a victim today? Let me give you a few things that will help you move from being a victim to victor. Choose life. Back in Deuteronomy verse 30, or chapter 30, verses 15 and 19. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. I call heaven and earth as witness today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both you and your descendants may live. Choose life. In choosing life, three things happen for us. Three major things in our life happen for us when we choose life. God, I will not allow the death of Satan to overcome me. I will not allow him to gradually and day by day beat me down and take me toward death. I am living the life of Christ. Number one, we become unstoppable. I'm telling you, you become unstoppable. When you believe that Jesus Christ is the life, I have the life of Christ living in me. When you believe that, you will accept these words. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Are you ready for them? Listen, many of you know them. Many of you have memorized those words. You could say them in the place that I just said them. You could come up here and quote that verse. I believe, I believe in my heart that I can do all things through Christ because he strengthens me. But when you get out there where the rubber meets the road, how's it working for you? How's it working in the everyday life? It better make you unstoppable. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. Nothing will deter me from that. Satan can't come against me because greater than is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And Satan, you have no effect on my life. You cannot stop me. You cannot hurt me. You can't take things from me. You can't make me want. You can't make me desire things. You can't tempt me. You can't do any of these things. I do not allow you to do that. Why? Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. You say, well, can't Satan come and tempt you? Well, sure he can, but he's not going to test me very far. He can try to tempt me, but I'm not going to pay a bit of attention to him. Get out of here. Get thee behind me, Satan. Get away from me. Temptation only really comes when I allow it to happen. When I say, well, yeah, maybe that might be a good idea. Maybe that's the way I want to go. I might. Listen, we stop it. Nip it in the bud. That's what we do. We stop it immediately. Do not allow Satan to tempt me. No, I know better than that. Do you know how I know better than that? Because I know the word of God. I know what God wants me to do. I know what God doesn't want me to do. I know how God wants me to behave. I know how God wants me to think. I know how God wants me to set my mind. I know the things he wants me to set my mind upon. And you say, well, you know that because you're a preacher and you know the word and you've been around all these years and you've learned it and you've studied it and you've preached it and you teach it. Listen. The same word is in your heart and in your mind. You have the conviction of the Holy Spirit to tell you what's right and what's wrong. Thank you. Come on, loud and proud. Let's say it. Amen. We have the conviction of the Holy Spirit who tells us what's right and wrong. God will never leave you. God will never forsake you. And that means when you're in a situation and you don't know which way to turn, God will always show you the direction to turn. He'll be faithful. His Holy Spirit does that. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 15. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. I want people to see the power of God in me. I want people to see the change that God has made in me. But I don't want them to see me, I want them to see God. We're hard pressed on every side, yet we're not crushed. Feel hard pressed? Sure you do. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, 
And if you think you're a Christian, you're not going to be persecuted. You think people are not going to come against you. You think people are not going to test your faith. You think God's not going to allow those people around you to test your faith. Then you've got another thing coming, as my daddy used to say. We know that if we're in this world, we're going to suffer persecution. So I have a little phrase that's just get over it. <laughs> Fran knows about that. She teases me all the time about that. But I mean, what do we need to do in this life? We need to just get over that, in essence. And we need to just understand that, yes, we're going to go through persecution. Yes, we're going to suffer as a Christian. It's not going to be easy. Everybody who was anybody for Christ went through difficulties and struggles. Why do you think Paul was in prison and in chains and bound and all of those things, and you deserve to be free of that? Huh? Why do you think they had to suffer? Why did Paul and Silas have to go through these things and Barnabas and all these people have to suffer for Jesus? Why did they do it? They did it so that you can know the freedom in Christ that you have. Come on, church, you need to know it. You need to live in it and walk in it. Listen, we're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. You get that phrase? We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. You can persecute me, but God's still with me. He'll never forsake me. We're struck down, but not destroyed. I can tell you, you can burn this body, but you can't take my salvation. You can take everything in this life from me, but you can't take my Jesus. You can take everything in this life, but you can't take heaven. It's a promised home, and I'm going to be there. So the worst you can do to me is kill me. Oh, boy. Everybody might say, well, are you just crazy, mister? Kill me? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you something. I just wake up on the other side. <laughs> I'll just wake up with Jesus. And I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to be a whole lot more happy than you are if you're still here. I think about those that have gone before, and I'm not sad for them one bit. Just lost George and my dad and all these folk, and you've lost loved ones, and some have lost their dads and different ones in here. I'm going to tell you what, those who are in heaven are dancing on streets of gold and enjoying being there with the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're just in awe. As Jim sang last week, I can only imagine. <laughs> just in awe. They're just in awe right now in heaven. Well, that's where we're going. We're not destroyed. Always carrying about in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Now this next two verses, you got to think with me a little bit here, okay? But let's get this. Always carrying about in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Because he suffered, I will suffer. That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our bodies. See, Jesus was victorious, so we're going to suffer, but he was victorious, so we will be victorious. For we who live always, uh, are, are, are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our mortal flesh. Delivered to death, yep, people come against you, people would try to destroy you. Satan is always against you. He will destroy you if he can. But the life of Jesus is manifest. See, the difference is I'm of Christ. I think different. I act different. I walk different. I talk different. I'm just different. And the only reason I'm different is not because I'm a good guy, not because I've got it all together in life, not because I read the right books and I know psychologically how to handle you and other people and how to deal with these things. But the difference is I have Jesus. He makes the difference. People say to me, well, if you bang your finger with a hammer, don't you really cuss and go a blue streak? The answer to that is this, N-O. I do not cuss. I do not take the Lord's name in vain. I don't use damn and hell. I don't use any of those words. I never, ever, ever, ever use any of those words. Why? Because Jesus delivered me from all of those words after I got out of the military some time back. I prayed and asked God to take that out of my vocabulary. I asked God to take that away from me, and I never think about using those, no matter what happened. I don't say, oh, blank. I just don't. And it doesn't make me any better, folk. It makes me a person who's been delivered. I used to. I said, Satan, you've used me long enough. Well, you mean to tell me you don't? Oh, yeah, I don't. All right. So then death is working in us, but life in you. So Satan's coming against me, but what's it do? It brings life in other people. The next thing it does after it makes us unstoppable is it subsides stress. Wow. I don't want to start over here with Eric and go around the room and ask who's got stress. 
<laughs> I see that. You're looking at me like this. Oh, <laughs> you know, because every one of us has stress. But you know what? The stress can come, and the stress can rest upon us, and it can ride us so hard, and it can drive us to certain points. But you know what? We can look at that stress in the eye and say, you're not going to get me down. I'm not going to allow this to happen because I'm going to take this stress and it's now become a terrible burden and I'm going to give it to Jesus. And I go to the Lord and I go to the cross and I say, Lord, your word tells me I can cast all these cares and these worries and these frustrations and this anger and this bitterness and hatred, whatever it might be, I can cast it upon you because you care for me. So Lord, tonight I want to go to sleep. I haven't been sleeping very good for the last few nights. I've allowed Satan to allow that stress to just get me in turmoil. But tonight I want to rest. And in Jesus' name, I allow you to have this stress, this pain, this suffering, this hurt, this whatever it is. Lord, you take it. When was the last time you told the Lord that you want to cast it on him because he's promised that he'll care for you and deliver you? That's what you need to do. It subsides stress. Third thing it does, it gives us victory. That's what we're talking about. Romans 8, 37 says, in all these things, when all these things come to us, we're more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors because we have chosen life. The second thing we need to do is walk in faith. Now, I mean walk in faith. Don't tell me you have faith if you're not walking in it. You're only fooling yourself. You're kidding yourself. Faith is active. Faith is something that you do, not something that you have in your head. You say, well, I trust in Jesus and I believe in him, so I have faith in Jesus Christ. Listen, that faith must become active. You have to live that faith every day. You have to walk it, you have to talk it, you have to believe it in your heart and let it come out in your actions. If it does not come out in words and in actions, then you have no faith. Don't kid yourself. Well, I'm a person of faith because I go to church, so I believe in Jesus. No, you believe in Jesus when you start living like Jesus. Show me. Don't just tell me. Let me see Christ in you. Paul said it over and over. He said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is in you, living in you, in the person of the Holy Spirit. God is right there with you. God didn't save you and leave you and go back to heaven and someday he's going to take you back to him and you just struggle and make it on your own here. He put his very person, his very self, his very entity in you, in the person of the Holy Spirit. He lives in you. And that person indwells you. The Holy Spirit, God living in you. He knows every thought, every action, everything you do. And what we do is we begin to walk in faith. Wait a minute, Jesus said I can trust him for that. Wait a minute, I don't have to worry about my finances. Wait a minute, I don't have to worry about these things. I don't have to struggle with these things because we walk by faith and not by sight. Substance of things hoped for, Hebrews says. There's a substance to it. There's something more than just in your brain. Do you have faith? Yeah, I have faith. James says, you show me your works and I will see your faith. James said, you show me, I'm saying it again because I want to make sure you got it, your works and I will see your faith. Do you know how I know the faith of many people in this church? Because I see them pounding the pavement day after 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 day. You get it? They're here, they're working, they're doing, they're doing for God, they're doing for Christ, they continue. Things get tough, they hang in there. They may get a little angry at times with things or upset about things, and that happens to me, it happens to you, happens to all of us. But you know what? In faith, I'm going to keep a walking. Satan can try to trip us, he can try to stumble us. Matter of fact, there's a word used by James Puikulos in the Greek, and what it is, it's a word that means to stumble, to trip, and it's a, a bright lights that come to test you and to tempt you and to draw you away and to trip you up. That's what it means. But you know, Satan has no power to do that. So when something happens and things go wrong and things aren't good, I don't throw in the towel, I don't get angry and quit, I don't walk away, I don't do those things. I say, I'm going to keep on keeping on because I'm trusting in Christ. And I watch people, and I've watched so many people who claim to have faith, who when the tough things start to happen in life, 
they walk away. I've watched them walk away from God. I've watched them walk away from church. I've watched them walk away from homes, uh, wives, husbands, and things. I've watched them do this. And you know what I wonder? I wonder if there's really any faith there. Because I want to tell you something. It makes a difference when you come to Jesus Christ and you give your entire life to him. When you come to an altar and you lay your life on that altar, you say, Jesus, here it is. I no longer own myself. I am not my own. I was purchased with a price, with the precious blood of you that you gave on Calvary. And Lord, I give my life back to you. If you put stress and turmoil in my life, I know you're going to see me through. If you put people into my life that are unfaithful and don't work, work with me and help me, and so I, I, it's all right because I'm still going to be a Christian. I'm still going to walk with you. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to quit because faith is a walk. The reason I know Jim is a Christian is because I've watched him for the last 40 some years walk. Oh, I've seen him stumble, I've seen him fall. I've seen him go through difficult times and troubles and he's watched my life. But we both still stand for Jesus. That's what it's all about. We both still believe, we both still trust, we're both still walking. And you can't shut us down and you can't stop it. Walking by faith. Believe, see, and hope for what does not happen in the natural. That doesn't exist. God cares for me every day. God meets my needs. You can get up and say, I don't know how I'm going to make it through this day, and I don't know how we're going to do this, and I don't know how this is going to happen, and I don't know what, but I'm going to tell you something. When we see God doing the supernatural, the things that we cannot believe, things just happen just take place. And you say, whoa, how did that happen? It happened by faith. I'm a child of God, and he owns me, and he's going to work in other people and other situations to bring things around, turn things around, fix things, and take care of things. I don't even know what he's doing, but he's doing it. And when you begin to see that, you know you're walking in faith. When you're stumbling and tripping and laying in the muck and mire all day and every day and you don't know why and what, listen, God's doing unbelievable things. The third thing we need to do is speak faith. Speak in faith. Speak in faith. I find very few Christians do this. I'm telling you, very few Christians do this. Listen, write those verses down, but I'm going to tell you about speaking in faith. Speaking in faith say, I may, says, I may be going through this difficulty. I may be having this loss. I may be hurting in this way. I don't understand what to do. I don't know what's going to happen, but I do know this. I do know that I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he cares for me. I know that he will never leave me or forsake me. I know that he will always meet my need. I know that he will always be faithful. I know that God will never fail. I know that God will never let me down. I believe these things in my heart. I trust him and I speak faith. I get so tired of hearing people who say I'm Christian. Quote, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. But this is bad and that's wrong and somebody's hurting them and somebody's going to do this and this will never happen and you will never win there and we'll never have victory there. And you know, I'll tell you what, when I sit down with, with people in the church, I let them know right away, you're going to walk with me in this ministry? We're going to trust Jesus Christ for everything, and he's going to meet our needs, and we're not going to, we're not going to be faithless people. We're not going to sit in the board and try and figure out how to work all the details out and everything else. We're going to put it in the hands of God through prayer. We're going to trust Jesus for everything, and he's going to do it. And you know what? I stand here before you and can tell you that he is faithful. He's faithful. I can tell you he's never let me down. I mean never. Never, ever, ever let me down. Lots of people have. Lots of friends have. Lots of family have. People have through the years. But Jesus has always been my side. By my side. He's always been my comforter. He's always been my peace. He always brings me joy. I know he's there to help me. I know he loves me. How many of you have just experienced a little bit of that, at least in your life? Can you put your hands up? Look at the hands. 
This is the church of believers. Thank God. Speak faith. I'm telling you today it works, folk. Oh, Romans 10, 8 to 11, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him shall never be put to faith. Speak faith. Act on what you believe. Act on it. You say, I believe this and I believe that and I trust and act on it. I know you say, well, isn't that the same as living it? Well, you need to live it every day, every moment. You need to speak it. You need to believe it. You need to trust it. But you need to act on it. You need to act on it. God is going to see me through. I trust God. Now, if I'm looking for others and other things and other circumstances and other entities to help me and bring me out of these things and work, listen, I'm looking to God and I act on it. And you need to step out and act on that. Deuteronomy 30, 14 says that he, you may do it. In Hebrews chapter 11, there's a whole list of people who are heroes of the faith. Listen, heroes of the faith. Every single one of them acted. Read it over. This is what they did. God isn't telling you in Hebrews 11 what they believed. God isn't telling you in Hebrews 11 what they hoped would happen. God is telling you in Hebrews 11 what they did. They acted. I remember when I was a child. I've told this story, and many people in this place probably have heard it, but I'm going to share it. When I was a child, you all know my dad and mom. Many of you did. And uh, you know how they trusted God. I was, a child, I was one of many children living in a home where we had three bedrooms and a path. Did you get that? <laughs> Out back, we didn't have running water in the house. We didn't have a lot of things. We had a stove that we put wood in and uh, kept it going and so forth. The water was heated on the side of the stove. You all remember that? I remember those days. All right. Some of you say, what are you talking about? Look, Google it. <laughs> You'll find it. <laughs> Wood-burning stoves of oil. You'll understand those things. You'll see them. Anyhow, there was a time when we had no food. No food in our home. Thank God for Faith Alive Pantry. That's a wonderful thing. It helps us, doesn't it? There was a time when we had no food. And you know what my dad did? My dad said, many of you know this story, but that's all right. It bears repeating. Dad said, set the table to my mother. Set the table? Set the table. We're going to eat. I think she had an apple and something else in the whole house. How am I going to set the table? My mother got out the plates and the silverware and the forks and the knives and set them and the napkins and the whatever else she put on the table and she got out the bowls and the platters and whatever it was and set it on the table. And the whole table was set, and Dad said, all right, children, come on, let's sit down. <laughs> yes, we thought he had lost it. We didn't know what had been going on with Dad. What is this? Didn't smell a thing cooking. We knew Mom wasn't in the kitchen cooking. She had nothing to cook. And we sat down at the table. My father sat at the head of the table, as he always did, and he opened his Bible he began to read. And I don't know what he read, but he might have read, my God shall supply all of your need. I don't know. But then he bowed his head and he began to pray. And he said something like, dear God, we're here to serve you. I've brought my family to this place to serve you. And I'm here for that purpose. And I want to serve you. And, and, and Lord, my family's hungry. And I know you know that. And we need to eat. And you need to provide for us. And so in Jesus' name, we claim that provision. Amen. As soon as my dad said amen, on the old screen door on the back. You know what I'm talking about. That one that was black with that wire that went in. <laughs> Hold him up. <laughs> Twist him. You know what I'm talking about. And I looked out that screen door, and here was Mr. Swearingen 
never forget him, had his Model A out there with crates strapped to the side. Came in and said, hey, we butchered a hog today. My wife was in the garden and got some vegetables for you. Just thought we'd bring you some stuff. Right after my dad prayed, Jesus delivered the food through Mr. Swearingen. <laughs> Jesus delivered the food. Why am I sharing this? I know it's time to go, and we'll go. I'll close in just a second. Why am I telling you this? Because my dad taught me. Now, God is my teacher. Jesus is my teacher. But I'm thankful I had a dad who said, no, I'm not calling somebody and borrowing some money and going to the Kroger's and getting something to eat. Was Kroger's around that time? I doubt it. But we're not going to do that. We serve a living, risen Savior. And we serve one who can provide for us. God had already been providing, knowing the need. You get the picture? So my dad acted on it. Now, how did he act on it? Set the table. I'm going to tell you what you need to do when you're down and you don't have. You need to set the table. Prepare for the blessing. Because if you believe it, it's coming. Listen, you're not a victim. You can be absolutely a victor in Jesus Christ. He has provided everything for you. Claim it. Live it. Walk it. Believe it. Trust Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you've done in our lives. Lord, how true it is when I say you've never failed me. And I know there are many in here who could testify to that. You've never failed us. You never leave us. You never leave us empty and without. Our lives are full. Our lives are overflowing. Our lives are filled with your joy. Our lives are filled with your provision. And Lord, we have all that we need because you know what we need. And Father, I'm thankful for all you have done and all you're about to do. Lord, some are going into this year perplexed, but they're not downtrodden. Some are going into this year troubled, but they haven't lost faith or hope because you are in their life. Oh God, help us to lay hold of these truths, to walk and march into this year filled with the power of God, knowing that this is going to be a year of victory and our life will change. Father, teach us that faith is what brings these things about in our life and faith is action. I'm going to serve God, walk with him, do his, his bidding because everything in my life needs to fall into place and God can only allow that to happen when I'm doing what he wants me to do. So thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will just touch every heart here Bless those who are hurting and those who are in need, that whom we've prayed for today, we've lifted up before your throne. We're reminded of their physical needs and, and other needs. Lord, touch them, deliver them. And Father, if there's one here in this place today who doesn't know you as Savior, may this be their day of salvation. And Father, I pray that if there's one struggling and hurting, this will be their moment of deliverance right now. Let them claim that right now in Jesus' name. Now, if you're here today and God has spoken to you and you have an issue in your life that you're delivering over to God right now and you're going to trust him, and this moment you're just going to put it in God's hands and leave it there at the cross, would you just put your hand up so I know God has spoken to you? Thank you. Hands going up all across the auditorium. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, I pray for these who have raised their hands. I ask you in Jesus' name to meet their need. Meet it according to your will and your plan and your way. Help them to walk in this truth, not only to believe it in their head and mind and heart, Lord, but even to walk it and trust you and believe you for what you're going to do. Thank you for the victory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.